minimize that. Minimize that. <clears throat> so I, um, I, I tend to not reinvent the wheel when it comes to creating lessons. And, uh, and you'll find that that's, that's kind of like a, uh, a, a universal teaching strategy. You know, if somebody else has already done it and they're not, and they haven't copyrighted the material, then, uh, then you can go ahead and use that to, to suit your own needs. Uh, and and <clears throat> when you're actually teaching, you'll find that one of the biggest frustrations that you could ever possibly experience is when somebody tries to make money off of a concept that clearly is not their own. So if you've ever heard of Teachers Pay Teachers, you know, that website, almost everything you see on there is is material that was copied from a textbook or adapted from somebody else's work, but now all of a sudden somebody's like, well, I'm gonna make money off of this. Right? And so, uh, so that, that's kind of like a big no-no in the, in the teaching world. You know, it's like you create something and you share that something with the rest of everybody else because that, that's just how it goes, all right? So anything that I provide you is, is definitely uh, yours to keep, all right? So <clears throat> promoting problem solving skills in the elementary, in the elementary grades. So, and, and you know, like you could substitute the words elementary grades with uh, every grades, you know, with all grades. Uh, hold on one sec uh, and just pause this real quick resume the recording uh, yeah so we can uh, we can apply problem solving strategies these particular problem solving strategies to any, really any grade level right? and you know the blurb there problem solving is an essential if sometimes neglected skill that demands attention from the earliest grades students must learn to question and apply mathematical concepts to uh, to problem solving situations on a regular basis to support students in this goal teachers need to create a classroom environment that embraces discourse, which at the younger levels is very, very tricky because you want the students to participate, you want them to engage with the material, but it's very easy to get down a rabbit hole that involves, well, I remember the time when my uncle uh, did this, that, and the other thing, and it's like, well, yeah, that's great, but we're, we're trying to solve a problem here, you know, so without hurting feelings, we need to kind of keep it steered in the right direction. Bridge the gap between students' ordinary language and the formal languages of, of the formal language of mathematics. That's probably the, the most important one, if there is an important one, <clears throat> uh, if there is a most important one, I mean to say, out of this list. And, um, Oh, this is interesting. Of course, my pen isn't working. But ordinary language it must have just died on me. All right, I'll go with the old school. Disconnect up pencil. And there we go. So, ordinary language and the formal language. So we're trying to make that connection, right? Because what happens is, and, and this, this is kind of like a, a pre-Common Core um, methodology. Uh, prior to Common Core coming into, an, in, into existence, we had, uh, you know, I don't even know what they called it, but on the high school level, it was the Math A, Math B curriculum. Uh, but it, it worked its way down into the younger levels. Everyday math was part of it. And so uh, the big push on in that area was students can explain their thinking in any way that makes sense to them as long as it's correct, right? So they could use whatever words that they want as long as it, as long as it gets the idea across. You can tell that they got the point, right? So then what happens is you flash forward 10 years, those students are no longer in elementary school, they're graduating high school, they're going off to college, and they're bombing every math class that they're taking. And that's because there is an expectation that eventually they're going to have fluency in the, in the language of mathematics, but that wasn't promoted in that environment. Right? So then flash forward to Common Core, where they flipped it on its head and they said, okay, let's go the other way. Forget about the ordinary language. Let's focus 
almost 100% on the formal language of mathematics. So now everything is discussed in terms of cardinality and ordinality. And when you get to the high school level, it's not, um, you can't say foil if you remember that term for factoring. Look, that, that was a big no-no in Common Core. You can't say foil. Foil, that, that, that's too ordinary. That's not formal enough. So what you have to say is, you have to say double distribute, right? Because you're distributing twice. Well, there was a problem with that, right? And that problem was they couldn't connect that to anything that they were familiar with, the students. So now we're finally at a point where it's like, okay, listen, we gotta do both. We gotta, we gotta let them think of it in terms of their ordinary language, but then just like a person that's learning a foreign language for the first time, they gotta translate it. You know? Now, when you become fluent in the foreign language, you know, like truly fluent, then you start thinking in terms of that foreign language or you become capable of thinking in terms of that foreign language. That's a different story. We're not, we're not even talking about that. We're talking about the ability to translate and say, okay, this is what I think, now let me look in my, in my file folder in my mind and say, okay, what does that translate to? That translates to double distribute. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna write down on paper because that's what it's equivalent to, all right? So that, that became a very, very important piece of the, the development of the next gen curriculum, right? Uh, focus on teaching strategies and conceptual understanding that kind of goes hand in hand because if you are able to translate from ordinary language to formal language, then I think that means that you got a good handle. You have a very good handle actually on the, the conceptual aspects of the material. So you, you have conceptual, conceptual understanding, right? So let me pause here. It looks like I got a, right? So, <clears throat> so how do you promote discourse? You know, so, uh, that's the big that's the big challenge uh, essential techniques for promoting discord in, include modeling and think alouds right so uh, one thing i've never been too keen on as a teacher is using buzz phrases right so think alouds I, 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 it just it irks me and it irked me to have to put that out down on paper but it, it's another thing of like ordinary language in the formal language right so what's going to happen is you're going to think of a strategy of how you want to instruct your students, but in order for it to be something that can be translated or or shared with other professionals, you got you got to know the vocabulary, right? So you, you learn about things called uh, you know uh, performance based assessments, right? Um, or differentiated instruction, you know the common sense terms, but it's like. All right, well, what, is, what does that mean in normal people speak? So what's a think aloud? A think aloud is, is a stream of consciousness where you're really just saying everything that comes into your mind as you're trying to solve a problem, right? Which can be very, very tricky on the younger levels because sometimes they really do say everything that comes into their minds. And for better or for worse, you, you ask them to do it, so that means they're gonna do it, and now, uh, you know, no, you can't take it back, you know? So you're, you're kind of in the jam because you want them to focus on the math, but you gotta, you gotta adeptly steer them towards that, right? So what the goal here is, you give them a problem, you model the problem, all right? So modeling means that you're, you're taking them through the, the appropriate, uh, methodology for solving that problem, right? Then you give them a task of, related to similar concepts right? and you ask them to solve it, but in small groups, they are asked to think aloud. So one person would have the floor and share their thoughts as they're going through it. They say, okay, well, I'm gonna write down the problem now. Then once I write down the problem, I'm gonna, okay, what do I wanna do now? All right, well, I think I want to multiply these two things first. All right, so I did that, now what, now what, now what? Think, think, think. Uh, maybe I'll add, maybe I'll subtract. I'm not really sure. What, what do you think, Charlie? You know, like, and, and before you know it, they're having conversations and, and it's kind of working itself out. Drawback, the obvious drawback is some people do that naturally. Like you walk into a classroom or if you, you just walk into like Metro North, you go on a train, and some people are thinking out loud every single thing that they're doing. Like, yeah, okay, so uh, once I get off the train, I'm gonna go grab my coffee, and then once I grab my coffee, and all kind of steps, and 
no one would go, oh, okay. You know, so like all that stuff happens naturally to the point where it's like, yeah, I wish this guy would shut up, you know, but it, to encourage it to happen for people who don't naturally uh, air their thoughts, you know, that, that's, uh, that's the big challenge, right? So to coax that information out of them, uh, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of doing. And so what ends up happening as teachers, we tend to gravitate towards the students that share their thoughts. And that, you know, the student's gonna, they're gonna talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And so they're, they're carrying the class and that's fine, right? But we have to make sure that we dedicate enough time to coax out of the quieter students the same, well, maybe not even the same, just something moving towards what we're trying to get out of the, or what we're already getting out of the, uh, the more vocal students, right? So when we're promoting discourse, we want the students to understand the question in theory. So we gotta help them do that. Select the strategy, apply that strategy, and then perform some kind of check. All right. So when you're talking through the process, the, the verbalizing uh, takes a couple of forms. Again, it's the ordinary thinking. I'm going to plus these two things together. Okay, cool. So you know you're supposed to add. Now let's try to take that word you use plus and use it appropriately. So I'm going to add these two things together. All right. So just a simple example, but I hope that gets the idea across. All right, so a couple of activities can be used to kind of carry carry this process forward. You can do a problem of the day, right? You can you can have students share solutions, right? If you're going with the problem of the day approach, uh, it, it's really just following all the same steps that we just talked about: understanding the question, selecting a strategy, applying a strategy, and checking your answer, right? But the thing that we want to keep in mind or a very, very important thing is when that strategy takes shape, we have those three methods for representing a mathematical solution. We have the visual, oh, this pen is terrible. All right, we have the numerical. And we have the verbal. All right, the visual, the numerical, and the verbal. Right. So, the numerical one—that's you know, like when they get uh, to the older grades, that becomes like the algebraic approach. You know, like solid algebraic. Like the visual becomes the graphical approach. The verbal is still the verbal. That's the explanation. Right. Tell me, tell me how you arrived at your answer. You know, and in some cases, it's. Uh, it's a little easier for them to explain. And in other cases, it's like, so I took the thing and I added to it the other thing and I, I don't know really what I'm saying. So sometimes what they do is they kind of mix and match and they say, all right, well, I got my visual and I also got my verbal. Let me, let me use a little bit of visual. Let me use a little bit of verbal. So when the verbal starts failing me, I'll pick it up with a picture. Or when the verbal starts failing me, I'll pick it up with uh, numerical computations. Or this is my favorite because it gets students out of a jam big time in a lot of cases, even in the upper levels. Start off with the numerical, and then once they realize that they can't do the next step in, your, in their numerical process, they're like, I, I can't remember how to do it, but I can tell you how to do it. I just can't remember myself. I like, I know that I'm supposed to add these two things together. I just, you know, or I'm supposed to multiply these two things together. I just don't remember how to do that. You know, I, but I do know that they're supposed to multiply that. That's valuable information. Yeah. So if they're focusing on any of those three things, that's good conversation piece because when they're in their small groups, you could have two out of the three individuals in that group that are like kind of geared towards the verbal and somebody, you know, the third person is geared towards the visual. The, at, at the younger levels, you know, they'll, they'll politely say, oh, no, I think you're wrong. You know, I think our way is better because they got strength in numbers. They say, okay, two of us think it's this, you think it's that, we're, we're probably right because there's two of us and two is more than one, okay? But meanwhile, they're all right. They just have to be open-minded enough to say, okay, well, we'll explain your thinking and then we'll see if we can kind of uh, put put together a solution that that incorporates all of our ideas, right? So, 
you know, like the, the problem of the day, all the strategies there, like just delete extraneous information. That, that's kind of, uh, you know, that's, that's really more on us. Uh, in, in order to, to get the students to do that, we need to kind of teach them what is extraneous and what isn't. So, you know, day one of problem solving, if you were to tell them, I mean, I, I can't imagine in first or second grade class, anybody would say delete extraneous information. You know, it, what we'd say is, all right, let's make a list of all the things that we know and all the things that we want to know, all right? So these are all the things that we know. Now going down our list of things that we know, are every one of these things necessary? Do I need to know all of these facts in order to arrive at my answer? It doesn't look like I need to know that the sky is blue in order to determine how much it's gonna cost me at the grocery store to, to pay for my groceries. So I'm gonna get rid of that one. You know, I'm gonna just cross that out or erase it and just pretend it's not there because I wanna focus only on the important information. I don't wanna get bogged down on the irrelevant information. And I know that as students, uh, us personally as students, we get very aggravated when, uh, when you're presented with a word problem and it's got all these details and it turns out that hardly any of it was necessary. You only needed like two facts. You know, they, the, the question gives you like 10 facts and you only needed two of them. You're like, why, why, why'd you put all, the, the, all this stuff in here? Why, what's, what's up with the eight other facts? I, di I didn't need any of that. And, and it turns out that, that that was the point of the question for you to be able to sit through and say, I don't need to know any of this stuff. It's irrelevant to the problem, All right. Uh, another, another important one is uh, sharing student generated questions. That, that one, it is so hard to do. I can tell you that because as uh, specifically for math, these two go hand in hand, by the way, specifically for math, to get a student to write a question that actually works out that other students can solve and actually understand what the hell they're asking. It's so incredibly challenging. Just think about like you yourself, you know, you're the teacher, you're creating the questions for the class. Think about how, ch how challenging that is. Now you're asking a third grader to do it, right? So there's gonna be, uh, there's gonna be pitfalls, but, you know, the, the issue that comes into play more than anything else is the expectation. You know, like, this is kind of like, for a lot of you, the beginning of your, your journey in terms of, um, you know, be, becoming a teacher, maybe getting a teacher, teaching license, education classes down the line. Administrators, uh, cooperating teachers, um, just anybody who's teaching those ed classes that you'll take down the line, they all, they all love this concept. Student generated questions. They, they love it. They absolutely love it. It's, it's so hard to pull off in a meaningful way that if you don't, if you just say, okay, we just did a problem. We learned how to multiply. Now everybody write down a question that, that your partner can answer without giving them any kind of background on what makes a good question. It's a disaster. The other end, you know, the other side of that coin is that the administrator won't know the difference. So, you know, they don't know the difference in, in, in a math context between a good question and a bad question. So you could probably get away with it, but your students aren't going to gain anything from it, right? Because I've done it, oh, I've done it so many times where it's like, oh, they should very easily be able to come up with a question. And the nonsense I get is just, it's, it's astounding. So you want to get into the characteristics of a good question and it, it comes back to all of this stuff up here where, where we're promoting the problem solving skills. We want to embrace discourse. So you want to have a question that's going to encourage conversation. You want something that's going to require them to think, but then also end up using the formal language of mathematics. And then the, the strategies, what, what kind of strategy, strategies are they using? We want them to be able to uh, articulate what those strategies are. Right, so th these are all ingredients that make a good question, uh, a good open-ended question, right? Because, you know, multiple choice is multiple choice, but the good open-ended questions are gonna have the characteristics where they promote discourse. Right, they, I'll say that it, just to kind of keep it simple, engage, 
the three methods. of math solutions. All right, so that's, again, that's your numerical, verbal, and visual, right? And they incorporate the language. But I think that goes hand in hand, you know, because the language comes into the verbal response. So I don't want to, I don't want to write too many details there, because otherwise I'm just going to replicate the stuff that I already typed. All right, but if you have promoting discourse and engaging the three methods of math solution, then, then, then you're going to be in a pretty good spot. Now, in terms of the actual question, uh, geez, it better be relatable. I don't know if I spelled relatable right, but I'm going to pretend I did if I didn't, right? So relatable, it's got to be relatable. Right? So if I'm going to talk about I mean, it, I could talk about, um, you know, navigating from home to school, right? So what I do is I take the elevator down from my, my third floor apartment, then I walk three blocks, get on the subway, I take that three stops, then I take the, uh, the Crosstown bus to the west side, and then I get out and I walk three more blocks, right? Great, great scenario, great description, all right? The problem is I, I give that problem to a kid who lives in Arkansas, they're not gonna know what the hell I'm talking about, all right? They, they can kind of visualize, they're like a subway, I, I would imagine you're talking about a means of transportation, not the, uh, not the sandwich place, you know? But apartment, you know, I live in a farm, you know, I, I live in a rural area. Okay, I guess apartments are small places to live. Oh, people have elevators in their houses. That's crazy, you know. But then the other way around, if I if I talk about, you know, like a question that involves daylight saving time, right? So that's that's a pretty good question, you know. So you start you talking about clock math, and you say, okay, you wake up at four o'clock in the morning to milk the cows, but it's daylight saving time, and you know the you know new question, you know, like what time would you be waking up to, to milk the cows? And it's like, all right, cool. For some kid who lives in the, in the middle of farm country, that's great. But you give, you give that to somebody who lives in, uh, you know, even in White Plains. And it's like, that's kind of funny. You know, like I'm not milking cows, but I guess somebody out there does. So you just got to make sure it's something that's relatable, you know, and you get into things like, it, it's kind of weird to think this way, but Sometimes the choice in cars, like if you have a question that talks about cars, you know, like miles per gallon or, you know, distance traveled when you're driving to work and stuff like that. You get an elementary class in the middle of Manhattan, you know, it's like, I mean, how often are they driving to, driving to work? You know, definitely not driving to work and how often are they driving to school? Probably not very often. You know, the reality is they're probably taking you know, walking or taking public transportation, if they are driving, then that, you know, that's, you know, that's a possibility, but it's probably not happening as frequently as somebody who lives in the sticks, you know? So uh, definitely make it something relatable. You don't want the nature of the question to be distracting to the students, right? Because what, what ends up happening when you're promoting discourse, if your question is so distracting because it's so foreign to them, then, then you get nothing done. They're too busy trying to talk about what, what it must be like to milk a cow. You know, they're not even talking about uh, the math line, right? Uh, the next one, sharing solutions. That, that's, that's the easy one. I talked about that earlier. You know, Tommy likes to do it the visual way. Uh, Christina likes to do it the numerical way. You know, they're both right, but they need to have a meeting of the minds in order to kind of flesh out why each one is right. Um, encourage students to not just be it, you don't want them to just be satisfied with their way of solving the problem right you want them to learn what was going through other people's minds when they solved the problem why'd you do it that way yeah you know? and 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 the person who's being asked the question needs to be trained to not take offense and not feel like they're being put on the spot you know why'd you do it that way whoa whoa, whoa relax I did it this way because I'm smart. I don't know what to tell you. It's, that's the way that makes sense to me. 
you know instead you, you encourage them to say listen you know I, I i tried doing it this way it didn't work out for me and i, I did it that way you know so uh the, the encouragement is the ongoing uh underlying component that we always want to keep in mind right uh summarizing and paraphrasing always important because that's how we train the students to use their ordinary language and then bring it to a formal uh, formal way of discussing. Um, so the focus on language has a symbolic, a little typo there, symbolic, there should be a colon. Same thing with content specific and academic, right? So the symbolic colon, this refers to mathematical notation, addition, subtraction, you know, you could have multiplication, equal sign, whatever. Uh, context specific, uh, that, that's the trickiest one because it involves abstract mathematical concepts right, and skills. I found, and you know, this is, a, this is a personal belief, so I don't know in terms of prescribed approaches to things, I don't know how many people agree with me, but I've always found that if you talk about where the word came from, it, it, it tends to land a little bit more, even with the younger ones, right? So like where, like give a little history behind where these words came from, right? So talk about what words they're similar to, especially one like denominator, right? So denominator, where the hell did that come from, you know? But product, product, produce, you know? Or produce, all right? So you can get into, produce like as in vegetables and stuff like that where you can get into produce as in like your know, like factory production and things like that you know and how they might tie together right so you could say like you know factory work and keep it simple keep it simple in terms of the terminology because on, on the younger levels we talk about you know like um we wouldn't say necessarily a research biologist we'll probably just say a scientist right so we, we get into the uh, the background or the history of the terms. All right, but keep it as a simple history. Don't you know? Don't don't give them a give them a, an essay and have them read through that. Just give, keep it simple. But you know, if you have a factory worker that produces three hundred of whatever he's producing on a daily basis. You can start talking about, okay, well, over the course of 10 days, how much is he going to produce? Yeah. And you got into the idea of product. I, I use the word produce. So it's like, oh, wait, I think there might be a clue in what I just said as to what approach I should use. Okay. How many is he going to produce? Oh, I might want to multiply these two, uh, these two values. All right. The academic, these terms include test and discourse language, such as determine, simplify, predict, as well as students. Uh, as word students used to do, describe concept or activity such as add or take away, right? So the add and take away, those are the ordinary everyday language, but then the simplify, predict and determine and stuff like that, that's the, uh, the formal assessment language, right? So if I tell a student to simplify, I'm, I'm asking the, to take whatever I'm given, uh, what I'm, whatever I'm giving them and break it down into simpler terms, right? So, and, and predict, predict is a trickier one because it, it kind of makes it seem like I'm asking them to be a fortune teller, but I, I'm not asking for a personal opinion. And that, that's where you get, it gets a little tricky because to tell a, a, a second grader, I, hey, listen, I know it said predict, but I wasn't really asking for your opinion. You know, you're gonna hurt their feelings. So what you say is you define what predict means before you ask them to do that. Right, so you avoid that 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 awkwardness. Right, so I would say, okay, so this is what a prediction is. A prediction is when we follow a trend to see what a future outcome most likely would be. All right, so if I tell you that we're the the temperature is 90 degrees today, and it's 89 degrees tomorrow, and it's going to be 88 degrees the next day, 87 degrees the day after that what do you think that the temperature in degrees is going to be the following day, right? So it's decreasing by one degree every single day. If the trend holds, 
a reasonable assumption is going to be 86 degrees, right? But then that's where you can kind of have the conversation because generally some student is going to notice, well, wait a minute, does that mean it's going to be like zero degrees after, after 86 more days? It's like, well, it could be, but most likely not. So then you can start talking about, all right, well, how, does, how do weather patterns work? They decrease, they increase, they decrease, they increase. And so you can make predictions based off of that. You can start thinking about the cycle, all right? So, but these are, these are the conversations that you would wanna have, right? <clears throat> and not all of these conversations need to end up on paper. Sometimes it's just a matter of, hey, let's just talk for a few minutes. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? You know? And so uh, in, in terms of assessing, you're, you're doing it in a very informal, in, informal way. You're just keeping track of, all right, well, Chris participated today and, and, and he contributed this definition. You know, I asked him, you know, what he thought about that and he gave a really solid answer. So, you know, just make a note of that in your files that, that you know, he seemed to hit the mark when it came to that particular objective. You know, and maybe not everybody got to that objective on that same day, but you know, you can at least have a method by which you can keep track. You know, I, I, I like the idea of a clipboard, not necessarily a, a physical one, but like you could have a digital clipboard or just some way of just kind of keeping track where you have, you know, all the students and then you just identify based on your objectives. I got my 20 objectives for the, for the unit and just whenever you notice it, you can put a little check mark. Uh, I personally like to put the date, you know, the, the day that it happened, you know, so, so I have a, a pretty nice set of records there. Now, is it foolproof? No, because all I have at the end of the unit is, a, you know, a document or a spreadsheet that says that, that Jack met all of the objectives on this date, that date, that date, that date, but it doesn't say anything about like in what way he met the objectives. Right, so taking some notes here and there, it goes a long way, right? Because we all have memories of, uh, of our elementary school teachers and they're, you know, depending on the teacher, it was a different experience. Some of them were always kind of like working in the classroom, you know, telling stories, working with the kids. And some of them were just always in the front of the room and some of them never got out of their seat in the front desk, you know? And so it was, it was kind of a mixture. We all have our different experiences, but in one way, shape, or form, every one of those teachers had some method that allowed them to track the progress of their students, all right? And so, or at least that was my experience, all right? Um, <clears throat> activities that could be used to encourage mathematical language, you got the brainstorming, the list of words. Uh, you got guess my word, and that's a, that's a good one, all right? Uh, activity can be adapted for independent work. Uh, make a list of sentence clues and have students work individually with a partner to find the correct word wall term, right? Because word wall, you know, at the, at the younger ages, a word wall is a very powerful tool. tool. <clears throat> and I even find, you know, in my high school classes that I still use word walls, right? Uh, I have a lot of, um, or at least over the last 10 years or so, I've had a lot of ENL students. So, you know, that they're, they're not native English speakers. And so, I looked at it like at first I was like, let me create a word wall for my, my English language learners. And so I was like, okay, so let me do that. And so every time I would talk about something like at least, at least is a pretty, pretty tough example for a person who's not, you know, a native speaker of the English language, where you say at least and at most, you know, at most two, so meaning zero, one, and two, or two, I mean. So <clears throat> having that up on the wall, actually helped because anytime it would come up, I would have the word and a definition next to it, right? So I kind of went a little, little above and beyond with the word wall because it wasn't just the words on the wall, it was the words and their definition. So you can go either way with that, right? But I found over the course of time or the passage of time that that actually ended up benefiting all of my students because even with the students who were native English speakers, they still didn't know what at most meant, right? So having that up on the wall was, was a benefit to everybody. And so I, I kind of stuck with it and I kept, I kept that going. This is the year with the, uh, the pandemic and everything is the first year that I'm not doing it, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing it in a digital sense, right? So 
you know, you could you can go the word wall route, but if you play the the guess my word game, what you can do is you can you can actually have little clues, little mathematical related clues that deal with the operations, right? So the guess my word could be like maybe you're trying to give an operation, you know? So um, you give a little scenario, you know, the, the factory worker produces 300 items per day, right? Um, I have, there are 12 eggs per bat, uh, ter, per carton or per crate, and I have six crates, right? Um, let me think of one more. I could keep it simple. I'll just go with the, the like objects. So uh, everybody I know, you know, I, I, like I, I know like 30 people, for example, every one of the people that I know ha uh, owns four electronic devices, right? Regardless of what they are, you know, just little scenarios. And then the, the guess my word could be, well, which operation is it? Am I talking about addition? Am I talking about subtraction, multiplication, division? And so what they'd have to do is think about, okay, well, would it make sense to add those numbers? So if I tell you that everybody, I, so I, got, I know 30 people, everybody I know owns four electronic devices, would it make sense to add 30 and four? Would it make sense to subtract the two numbers? Would it make sense to multiply? Yeah, probably, right? Same thing with the eggs and the, the, the 12 per crate and six crates or whatever. You know, it, it's implying the concept of multiplication, right? And so you can kind of get that idea across. You know, this is a simple example, but that, that's something that you can kind of, uh, kind of use as a, as a strategy. <clears throat> as far as problem solving is concerned, these are, um, they, they actually try to encourage some of these to happen in the high school level. And I got to tell you that having 12th grade students act out a solution to a mathematical problem is not only difficult, but also very awkward. So it's definitely something that you got to kind of restrict to the appropriate age groups. Uh, having the younger ones act out a solution to a problem can be can be very meaningful, right? And it can also kind of uh, kind of get the juices flowing when it comes to them uh, being more active participants in the class. You get the quieter kids, and they have to act it out. Recommendation: don't don't make them go up in front of the entire class and act it out. Make make them act out their their response within their group. You know, you get a group of three or four students; they can act it out in their small groups. It just makes everybody's life easier. You, you have the, um, the ability to expose them to, you know, the, the tension and the, um, I, guess, I would almost say the, uh, the finality of having to present your thinking to your classmates, because once it's out there, it's out there. You know, like you, you're either prepared or you're not. You, you either thought it through or you didn't. When you're acting it out, you're, you're on the stage. I don't know that there's much more of a benefit to having you act it out in front of a class of 30 students than there is to do it in front of three other people, right? So, you know, just having those friendly faces, it goes a long way, especially in the younger grades. Now, some students want to actually act it out in front of the entire class, and that's a different story. You know, you can take requests and stuff like that. Uh, draw a picture, make a table. Uh, look for a pattern, make a list, make, making a model, uh, like a physical model, not a mathematical model. Uh, breaking down the problem into smaller parts, that's the most common one when you're doing it on paper, all right? Uh, but uh, the key ingredient is kind of like the, uh, I call it the, uh, the figure skating strategy, right? So identify what strategy they use, the figure skating approach, that, that's, um, you, you, you watch, you know, the Winter Olympics, and it is also like, uh, you, you see it in Summer Olympics with like the rhythmic gymnastics and stuff like that, where they go out and they, they, they do their routine and it looks wonderful. You know, it always looks so graceful, especially the, uh, the figure skating. It's like, I can't even ice skate and these people are dancing around and flipping through the air and all that stuff. It's like, oh, this is magnificent. And then, you know, me, I, I feel like I, I lose one year off the back end of my life every single time one, one of the uh, skaters falls because it, it just comes out of nowhere and then 
next thing you know, they're on their rear end. I'm like, oh my God, you know? So there's that part of it. But what I mean by <clears throat> the figure skating idea is that I look at the, their performance and I'm like, that was magnificent. And then I hear their scores out of 10 and it's like 6.2. 6.8, 6.4. I'm like, whoa, that's terrible. I thought she did a wonderful job, or he did a wonderful job, or the, they did a wonderful job. And it's like, how did that happen? How, how did they do so poorly? Well, it turned out that they didn't do what they said they were going to do. Right? They were supposed to do a couple of sow cows, a triple lutz in there, and uh, you know, uh, like a like an axle. You know, they were supposed to do all that stuff in that order. And they missed maybe a part of it. Maybe they, they only did, um, maybe instead of doing three triple luxes, they only did two triple luxes, you know? And it's like, oh, well, you screwed that up. But I didn't notice because I, I wasn't privy to the routine before, before they started it, you know? But the judges were, they had to submit their routine. They, the, the judges had to know what they were gonna do before they were doing it in order to rate them effectively. So me as a viewer, I was like, oh, that looked great. They did, they performed terribly, or in the eyes of the judges, performed terribly because they didn't do what they said they were going to do. So when the students are sharing their solutions, I want the other students to identify what strategy they use so that they can, they can get a sense, the students who are performing, whether or not their, uh, their approach landed. Now, it's obvious if they're, if they're acting it out then the other students better be able to say, you acted it out, you know, or you looked for a pattern, you know, things like that. But if one, if a student goes about it one way and the class is like, oh, I see what you did there. You drew a picture. And you're like, no, I, I, I was making a list. I'm like, whoa, okay, well, you didn't do a good job then. And right? then at least you have a, an idea, you have some feedback to give to the, the presenter, right? And that's really what it comes down to. Right, the, the learning process, <clears throat> right? So all of that stuff goes into problem solving and we're gonna tackle a lot of that stuff as we go forward in the course, because really when it comes down to the math, you know, you think about your own experiences, you think about any students that you may be working with, it almost always boils down to the same idea. I can do the problem when I know what the problem's asking. I just don't know what the problem's asking. That's the interpretation part of it. Because yeah. here it's like decimal representation of fractions. Okay, I'm going to convert the fraction into a decimal. But if I tell you in, a, in the form of a word problem, you know, second, third grade, uh, maybe fourth grade, if I tell you that, you know, Charlie ate uh, two slices out of a pizza, you know, a, a, an entire pie of pizza, or pizza pie as they say, uh, what percent of the pie remains? Then it's like, well, he's got to interpret that, okay, I got to create a fraction and then I got to kick that fraction over into percent form, right? But if he doesn't know to do that, then the skill that we're about to go over, it doesn't matter for anything, right? So how do we convert over into, uh, into decimal form? Well, it involves division. So <clears throat> a little blurb here, because fractions can be plotted as number, uh, plotted on number lines because every location on a number line corresponds to a line in base 10, it must be possible to represent fractions of base 10 as decimals, right? So, you know, it, it's, I'll, I'll get into the, the theory behind it a little bit more in a few minutes, but I'm going to steal my own thunder just a, just a tad here. And so what I'm going to say is we got a number line, at, well, two number lines. I'm going <clears> to... <throat> Frog in my throat. It's just killing me. The key, I suppose, is to actually listen when somebody says tea with honey. I just didn't do it. Instead, I'm chugging water, which I don't think is going to really help, but it feels good. And that's really all that matters. Right? So we're going from zero to 16. <clears throat> and then from zero to 10. All right, now I have my zero to 16. And when I say something is base 10, 
that means that it happens in 10 unit cycles. So like your, your place value chart, when we say the ones place, the tens place and so on, once we create a group of 10, we start the cycle over and start counting off another 10 values. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, then beyond the 10, another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, except we just call that 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. All right, then we start the cycle over again, collecting it into another group of 10. All right, so I'm gonna partition this 16. I'm gonna split it down the middle and do that consistently until I've accounted for every value between zero and 16. All right, the reason I do it this way is to get a sense of the spacing. Uh, that should be a 10. All right. Now, <clears throat> the remaining values, you don't have to actually label them as long as you plot them. So I will label the important one. Because I'm looking for 5 sixteenths. Right, so that value there is five. And so what I'm gonna do is draw a little arrow down to the base 10. Because five sixteenths in base 10, uh, be, I'm sorry, in base 16 equates to some value in base 10, right? And so when we're converting over to decimal form, that's really our only objective, right? So, <clears throat> I'm just gonna smidge this over a little bit. I just want it to be a little bit more aligned. All right, so then I'm gonna cut this in half. That's gonna give me a five. Now, cutting a five in half makes it a two and a half, so it's kind of a pain, but what I can do is I can break the zero to five into four equivalent regions, right? So one, two, eh, kind of, I'm a little bit shy here. I want to one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that, six, I wanted to do it without having to get measurements involved. So that, that's really what it comes down to. Okay, so I'd have one, two, three, oh, four quality three. And so, you know, it, it's an estimate, but you can see, hopefully, I mean, the spacing's a little off, I'll give you that, but you can see that five on the base 16 scale is gonna to amount to something in the neighborhood of three in the base 10 scale, right? So three and change out of 10, right? So that's visually where the 0.3125 is coming from, but you're not gonna get a 0.3125 from what I just did. It's gonna take a little bit more than that because if you, you know, you start trying to estimate it as like, I don't know too many people that are gonna come up with 0.3125. So what do you do? You actually divide, all right? Now, we're not really there yet in this course, uh, but we, we can handle some simple division. And so I, I just figured I'd take a few minutes and walk you through that. Uh, later on in the, in the course in uh, unit three, we'll get into the pedagogy, you know, the, the instructional techniques, the, the the best practices and stuff like that associated with uh, with division. But for now, we're just going to divide right? and we're going to do it the old school way. All right. So, oh, a little typo, a little typo for somebody. That should be 16. All right, five sixteens, because five six is definitely not 0.3125. All right. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we're going to take that five and divide it by 16, if that will do. 
vision thing wants to stay there. All right. Start getting into the uh, the theory behind it, and you, you know, it gets a little complicated. But in terms of just the steps, we would ask ourselves, well, how many times does sixteen go into five? And he would say, well, there, it's not going to. Right? There's there's not enough. So I need I need more I need I need more values to work with, right? But what I would really say is, it goes in zero times. All right. So, and, and this is the, this is kind of the theoretical part that often gets glossed over, because what people will say is, okay, well, just skip a term. You know, sixteen it doesn't work. So let's move over a term. Well, we want to think about what's really happening here. So when we're determining how many times 16 goes into five, we're really saying well, what, you know, like how many times will it evenly divide into five? Well, our possibilities would be 16 times zero, 16 times one, 16 times two, 16 times three, and so on, right? So if you just kind of make a list of those possibilities just off on the side somewhere, 16 times one, 16, I'm oh, sorry, it's times zero, times one, times two, and so on, we get results of zero, 16, 32, and so on. You know, so it's some values to start with, right? I have faith that we all know how to divide values. This is really just kind of getting into how, how are we gonna teach the kids to do it, you know? So I would say, okay, well, 16 times one is gonna to be too much. Right, that's going to give me 16. I only got five. So I got to go with 16 times zero. And so what we do is we take that, that zero and multiply it by the 16. And the result goes here with the idea that if it doesn't divide in evenly, there's probably going to be some kind of remainder. All right, so it ends up that this is, it ends up being a step that you can skip, but you don't want to go into a topic when you're teaching the math behind it. You don't want to go into a topic skipping steps from the beginning. Later on, when, when the students, and this is the key ingredient, when the students realize a step is unnecessary, that's when you have license to skip it. All right, and that's a big distinction because if the teacher leads the way and says, okay, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so it turns out we never, we don't really need to do this. So let's just skip that from now on. You just, you took that realization away from them, and you, I don't want to say you ruined the learning experience, but you didn't, you didn't help it, right? So, I show the step, I look at it, and I say, okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I'm going to subtract because I want to see what's left over. Right, I'm going to see what's left over from that that difference, and it turns out that it's five, and that takes me back to square one. It's oh, it didn't really change anything. All right, so then I need I need another digit because I, I need to be able to move on with this process. So I know that five and five point zero are the same thing. So I can always just keep adding zeros on after the five, is after the decimal point. Sorry and never have a problem because five, 5.0, 5.00, 5.0000, they're all the same, all right? So then <clears throat> that gives me license to make this into a 5.0, all right? But we're working two digits at a time, so what I do is I just bring down the zero, all right? So it's not like, I'm just trying to make a quality zero there. So it's not like we're just losing the decimal point. We're deciding that the decimal point isn't really relevant to what we're doing, All right? I can put it there. There's nothing wrong with putting it there. But I'm asking myself, how many times does the 16 go into the two digits of five zero, All right? So sometimes I've, I've experienced that students in the past have kind of gotten confused if I bring down the, the decimal. If I leave the decimal out of it, they seem to be a little bit uh, more comfortable with that. But 
you know, you, you, you got to know your audience. So once you, uh, once you start getting a little bit into the process, you start kind of feeling them out. All right. I'm going to get a couple more values here. 16 times three. Forty-eight, do like maybe two more. Sixty-four. All right. So, with my multiples of sixteen, I'm looking to see what's the largest value that will divide into the fifty. All right. So the largest value would be three because. That gets me to a 48, but it doesn't get me to anything larger than a 48, right? <clears throat> now, this is, you know, this is where the pedagogy has to kind of, kind of be the driving force, you know, pedagogy, you know, instructional techniques, uh, it has to be the driving force, not necessarily the uh, adherence to correct math, because really what we're doing, because I'm going to put a, a, a three up top here, but it's after a decimal, right? So really what I'm doing here is I'm not, I'm not actually taking the 16 and multiplying it by three. I'm actually taking the 16 and multiplying it by 0.3. So if I go back to this operation up here, it's really a 0.3, which becomes a 4.8, all right? But that tends to confuse people. So we just work with the digits and let the algorithm carry the way, all right? So what I'm gonna do is now, I'm going to take that three, multiply it by that exterior value, so same deal, and that's going to give me a new value over here. And let me make that a shorter arrow. 16 times three is 48. Like I said, it's really 4.8, but for the sake of making life a little bit more manageable, we just write the 48 because we just need two digits. All right, so we do the 50 minus the 48 is two. All right, <clears throat> now 16 <clears throat> won't divide evenly into the two, but it will divide evenly into 20. So we can pull down another digit. All right, but really what we're looking to see is a value that divides into 0.2 a 16 multiplied by something getting us a point two. So, you know, just looking at the digits, I would be saying 16 times one is 16. That's the one that I want. But if I take that number, multiply it by the outside, that's gonna give me a 16 and subtract it. You gotta be really thinking about what we're doing here. I'm not really, and, and again, it's happening behind the scenes. I'm not really multiplying 16 by one to get a 16, I'm multiplying 16 times 0 0.01, all right? Because that one is in the hundredths place. So really what's happening here, I can kind of tuck that over there. And based on the placement, what this would be giving me is a 0.16, right? Now, if you really think about it, because again, we assumed that, that this would really be a 4.8, which would make this a 0.2. This computation here, 16 times 0.01 is really a 0.16. But again, we, we get bogged down with all these decimal points that confuses the living daylights out of everybody, right? So we don't do that, we just leave them off. But that's really what's happening, right? Because 0.31 is really the same as 0.3 plus 0.01, right? That's why, and, and it's kind of weird when it all comes together, it's kind of weird to think of it, but that's why when they talk about place value charts, they have the students, or you will have the students, write 0.3125 as 0.3 plus 0.01 plus 0.002 plus 0.0005. It's like, well, what was the benefit of doing that? It's so that you could start to understand how this algorithm works, right? But most people are more comfortable with just following steps and getting the answer. But if, if you can kind of try to drive the point home, then 
that things start kind of working out, right, in terms of their ability to be successful in math. <clears throat> so we got a 0.04 here, but really, again, if we're disregarding the, the decimal points, we would just come up with a four. We'd say, okay, well, how many times does 16 go into four? Well, it doesn't, you know, it, it, we, need, we need another digit. So I bring down another one. So then I can say that 16 goes into 42 times, all right, evenly. But again, and I'm gonna belabor the point a little bit here, uh, and I'm sure the, uh, the aggravation has gotta be kicking in for some of us where it's like, just get on with it already. But it really is so important This is the same because it's three decimal places. When I look at that 0 0.312, that's three decimal places. So that's the same as saying 16 times 0 0.002, which when you multiply it, gives you a 0 0.00, <clears throat> sorry, a 0 0.032. <clears throat> I can't, um, I can't get a word out now today. every two seconds. So again, that 16 was multiplied by 0.3, which gave us a 4.8. Oh, Christ. Damn, it's really such a detriment when the apple pencil crops out on me. <clears throat> So this is really, when I say that 40, really when you carry out the subtraction, it's the same as saying 0 0.040. So from that, I'm subtracting off a 0 0.032, which in turn is gonna give me, really if it's just the digits, 40 minus 32 is eight. But we're looking at what it really is. What is it really? it's really 0 0.008, right? So that's, that's kind of the, the, the moral of the story here. It's like the, the combination of what you show on paper and what's really happening behind the scenes, right? So like I said, most people are fine saying, okay, it's just the eight. Still not enough if I'm trying to multiply through with that 16. 16 doesn't go into eight evenly. But if I bring down another digit, it will. That'll give me the 80 that I'm looking for. And I would say 16 times what is 80? 16 times five. But again, officially beating a dead horse here. Which is really just horrific. Horrific, not terrific. <clears throat> so this is the same because it's in the fourth decimal place. 0 0.0005, which in turn is going to give me a 0 0.0080. All right. And then once you carry out that subtraction, it divides in evenly and you have it. All right. But it brings up, I, I don't know, I call it. Uh, I call it a conundrum, for lack of a better term, slash, I like saying that word. But what happens is, in order to understand how to divide decimal values, you really gotta understand the concepts of decimals themselves, right? But in order to understand the concept of decimals, you need to know how to divide decimals. So it's kind of like, all right, and, and, and this happens in my stat class all the time, where it's like, all right, listen, you're not going to understand where any of these rules come from. You just got to believe that they work. And then later on, when you have the appropriate skills, we can go back and start to understand why they work the way they do. This is one of those things, because really, when you look at it, it's like, 
Ooh, that he just made that way more complicated than it needed to be. When the reality is it's really exactly the same as what it would be if you were to do it on your own, except you wouldn't have had all those decimal values, right? So let me just show you real quick. I'll give you the, the uh, Reader's Digest uh, abridged version, which used to mean something when Reader's Digest actually was a thing. I think it still is a thing. It's just not as popular as it used to be. Right, so <clears throat> 16 goes into five. Well, it doesn't. So I get a zero and then I say, you know what? Forget it, I'm just gonna skip the step. That's the ordinary way of doing it. So then I would say, okay, let's go the first two terms. How many times does 16 go into 50? Well, it goes into 53 times. Decimals here, so let's bring it on up because that's what you do. That's the process that you follow, right? The decimal lines up. We always want to make it line up with whatever's under the under the uh, division bar, also known as the uh, dividend. Uh, that vocabulary comes into play also at some point, right? So then we say, okay, 16 times three is 48. We're subtracting, gives you two left over. 16, there's not enough. So I bring down the next one, right? I bring down the zero. 16 goes into 20 once evenly once into 20, right? So that gives me a 16, subtract, gives me the four, 16 doesn't go into four evenly, right? So bring down the next digit, zero, 16 goes into 40 twice evenly, giving us 32, subtract, you get an eight, 16 doesn't go into 40, uh, sorry, eight evenly, so I need another digit. So I bring that down to come in and be part of the action. Uh, and actually, now that I think about it, I never actually drew another zero here. So now I got an 80, 16 goes into 85 times, and you get meh, meh, and there it is. All right. So you get the answer using the long division approach, but you never get into the, the why. All right. So, you know, it, it, you, obviously, in a third, fourth grade class, you're not going to start off with the approach that I used on the left. You're most likely going to start off with the one that I use on the right or something uh, similar, but eventually you got to get there. All right. Now, let me show you just because why not? Let me show you one other way to do it. All right. And this involves factors of 16. All right. So 16 is equal to two times two times two times two. If I can get my pen to work, I'll eventually write all that. Oh, that's too thick. So it's four twos multiplied together. Or you could write it as two to the fourth power, but at this age group, you're probably not getting into exponents, or at least not too frequently. Right. <clears throat> so what you can do is if I want to divide by 16, so 5 divided by 16 is the same as 5 divided by 2 divided by another 2 divided by another 2 divided by another 2. All right. So and th this would involve some 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 doing, I suppose. You got to do the work, but it's another strategy. And some kids will will take you down this road, you know. And, and that's when you're like, okay, so you're going to be on the math team because, or or in the math club because you you seem to have a, a solid intuition for math, right? So if I take the five and divide it by two, you're going to get two and a half, two point five. If I take the 2.5 divided by 2, you're going to get 1.25. Then it gets a little dicey after that, 1.25 divided by 2 is going to be 0.6, well, half of 25, right? So, or at least half of the, we got the 1.2 gives us the 6, so half of the 5 is going to be 2.5. And then the 0.625 
divided by two would give you eventually the three of 0.3125. All right, now I'm making that seem a whole lot easier than it really is. The reality is a lot of students would actually have to use long division for a couple of those steps, but they could use short division too, but they, they would have to actually carry out a process. So it could actually be a whole lot lengthier than what I'm showing here, but essentially they would be doing what I'm, you know, like those operations. They could also look at it and say, well, 16 is four times four, so let me divide by four, then divide by four again, all right? I actually encourage that a great deal when it comes to uh, mental computation. If you have a nice even number, like the number, uh, let's say, let's say 60, and I say it's 60 divided by, divided by four. It's really the same as divided by two divided by two. So cut 60 in half, what do you get? 30. Take that 30, cut it in half, what do you get? 15. So 15 is 60 divided by four. So you can, you can play it out that way also. All right, but for the sake of uh, moving this along a little bit, really it's just a matter of coming up with the quotient. So with point, uh, 1 12th or 3 7 you could just pop those into a calculator for now, but the bottom line is you'd have to carry out some kind of process in order to come up with those solutions, All right? So one divided by 12, you got that repeating decimal, which is fun. And that it's a good opportunity when you get a repeating decimal to talk about the notation. How do you how do you handle that? For a lot of students, they've they've never they've never seen what it would look like if you had a repeating decimal. They just think you just write them all out or you just kind of stop wherever you feel like. But we know that we're throwing the bar over the thing that repeats. All right. Then you have three sevenths which is really just a, a hideous looking decimal, but it does have the repetition also. So I look at the point four, two, eight, five, seven, one. But then you can see the four, two, eight, five, seven, one repeats again. So you, you have it, you just gotta put a nice bar over the whole shibbity bangity boom here. All right, if I can get a, uh, a line to actually come out on paper, right? So that that definitely takes a lot more doing, but definitely manageable, right? <clears throat> so when we get into the explanations, it's not not as difficult if you walk them through, right? The justification for these sorts of things, right? Uh, number one, I mean, the whole blurb there is really just kind of uh, talking about the diagram that I drew above. So you're going to see that there's a lot of uh, repetition from here on out because I did steal my own thunder a little bit. Um, but explain why we can use the fractions 5 6 and 5 thirds to represent the shaded region in the diagram. Well, if you look at what we're dealing with here, we have the, the, the one obvious one is the 5 6 because we have It's just like, this pen sucks. Six squares and five are shaded in. And you know what the worst part is? If I had, when my Apple Pencil died, if I had taken that time at that moment to put it on the charger, it would be ready to rock and roll by now. Ooh. So it is what it is. All right, five, six will work because we have six squares and five are shaded. All right, so that's fine. But then we have the five thirds. So that's kind of weird. So we can look at this a couple of ways. We can look at it and say this and I'll explain both ways. We can call this the whole, the, this being this thing that I'm highlighting here, right? Assuming I actually turn on the highlight. All right, so this is the whole. And then this would be the excess.
right? So the way we represent a whole is with the number one, right? So I would actually say that we're taking all of the whole and adding to it the excess. All right. So it's kind of like if I were to say that, you know, I, um, I completed one full inning of baseball. You know, I'm a pitcher. I got through one inning, but I only got two thirds uh, through two thirds of the next inning. You know, how many, how many innings did I complete? You know, as opposed to a game has six different parts, I completed five of them. You know, so the whole here would be the three out of three that I completed. The excess would be the two out of three that I completed from the second set. And then overall, when you add it together, you know, if you have a common denominator, bottom stays put, add the two tops, and we get five thirds, right? So if we're talking about it as a sum, right? So that's the other method I was talking about. It's not really a method as it, as it is a modality where we talk about you know, a numerical approach versus a verbal approach versus a graphical approach or a visual approach. So the visual is already given to us, right? So what we're doing here is we're using a combination of uh, numerical and verbal, right? So when I was justifying the five, six, it was like, well, how many squares do we have in total? We have a total of six and five of them are shaded in, right? So that, that's it. You think of it as like a, like a, a meter. You know, if like I've, I've almost filled all six of those meters or six component parts of the, those meters, right? As opposed to looking at them as parts of a sum, right? So if you look at them as parts of a sum, it's a different story, right? Now, the second example here is kind of along the lines of the number lines that I drew above. Where it says diagram below equates two sets of improper fractions. Use a strategy to find a fraction equivalent to three quarters, but with a denominator of six, right? So it's telling us to take a base four and make it into a base six. All right, so you got the strategy that's identified there. That's all well and good. I need to have three quarters, but with a denominator of six, okay? So I got my base four. Zero. Uh, I'll mark it up above. All right. Poor quality. Uh, blaming it on the pen, but it is what it is. And it is what it is. And then we have base six. So going from zero to six. Breaking that up, so I'll partition it. One, two, three, four, five. We have the zero and six, so we're good to go there. All right, so what I wanna do is take my three quarters, three quarters, and equate that to some measure in the scale out of six, All right? So, I don't even know where that came from. That's even better. I'm just trying to make an arrow, it's killing me. All right, so it's putting us somewhere in this neighborhood, All right? So the question would be, you know, like what, what really should it be? If it has a denominator of six, 0.75 by six, you know, we could just run those numbers. 0.75 is what three quarters is in decimal form times six is equal to 4.5. So did I do a hot job of making that look like 4.5? Uh, not, not so much, but I tried. You know, it's just you, you run into a little bit of an issue with the scaling. In theory, you really should use a, a ruler or, or some way of uh, more precisely coming up with the, uh, the, the tick marks, but 
if we already know what the value ought to be and we're using this as a way of verifying our answer, then, then we kind of have what we need. It's just uh, we don't we don't always want to rely on this as being the sole method by which we come up with our solutions. We want to use it as a as a supporting idea. It's kind of like if you were to read an article in a you know online you know Wikipedia or you know something you know something digital you know like a political uh, periodical or something like that. You can see like they have all their the statements, the conclusions that they're making, all the information, all that good stuff. But then usually they have some sort of diagram to go along with it, some sort of visual, right? And the visual is supposed to kind of fill in the blanks of what they're not covering with the computational or the verbal, right? So this does, I think, a fairly decent job, but it's, it's obviously not perfect, right? So three-fourths. Now, that being said, it could have been perfect if I, if I managed to draw a really nice diagram. It's just easier said than done. All right, so three fourths equates to 4.5 out of six. Now, it's generally considered to be a big no-no having a decimal as part of a fraction. However, the instructions here did not give me any wiggle room. It said, use a strategy to find a fraction equivalent to three quarters, but with a denominator of six, right? So, I can't convert it into any other denominator, any other type of base, because I'm locked in on a base six, right? I don't have a choice in the matter, right? So in those situations, you're allowed to keep, um, keep a decimal as part of your fraction. Also, you know, it, just for full transparency, there's actually nothing wrong with having a decimal in a fraction, right? Like really, it's just, on the age, the, for the age level that we're talking about, we generally want the students to learn, well, we more than generally, I overuse that term. We want the students to learn the skill of getting a fraction in simplest form. So with that in mind, we, we kind of, whether it's right or wrong, we lead them to believe certain things are true when they're not really true. All right, little white lies just to kind of stress the importance. It's like, well, we need you to know how to simplify fractions. So we make up rules like, well, you can't have a decimal as part of a fraction, right? Why not? That's the rule. It's not really a rule. It's just what we're telling them so that they do what we ask them to do, right? So uh, number three, if three quarters of a cup of snack food with, uh, oh boy, yeah, beaten by the uh, copy paste monster here. If three quarters of a cup of snack food, you, your daily value of calcium, uh, gives you your daily, provides you something. <laughs> I'll say gives, right? It's another typo. Gives you your daily value of calcium then what fraction of your daily value of calcium is in one cup of the snack food, right? Okay. So make a math drawing to help you solve this problem and explain your solution. Okay. So this is a question that we would ask uh, the, the students. Right? And, and what we're getting at here is the concept of a proportion. So three quarters gives you the full blown daily value of calcium, all right? It gives you all of all the calcium that you would ever need on a daily basis. Right, so if you had more than the three quarters, then obviously you're gonna have more than your daily value of calcium, but how much more, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at this and say three quarters of a cup gives 100% and I'll just say calcium. So I would want to know if it's one cup gives what percent of calcium, All right? Now it's very important here that we don't get too far ahead of ourselves because in the age level that we're dealing with, we're not looking at students who are going to be cross multiplying and solving proportions and things like that. 
we're, we're looking for the simplest way to go about doing this, not the most complicated way, okay? So what I would do is draw a diagram. And the beauty of a diagram, and I say this to even my high school students and my college students, that sometimes the diagram is most of the explanation, which is great because then you just have to throw in a couple extra words to explain the things that the diagram didn't quite illustrate, right? So three quarters, I'm gonna break this up. We'll split it down the middle. My line draw tool is failing me. Maybe I'm failing it, I don't know. I'll shade it in now. All right, so that's three quarters, right? So three out of four of a cup. So this whole shebang here, this whole rectangle, including the non-shaded part, amounts to one whole cup. All right, so I'll make a little note of that. One whole cup. All right, we also don't want to assume that they know measurements like cups and pints and things like that without you having instructed them on that, right? Because like I, I made the mistake of, I, for my calculus students, I was like, all right, we're gonna work on something called Newton's Law of Cooling. And the activity I assigned them was to um, get a hot beverage like coffee or tea or something like that. And, you know, like put it through the Keurig or right out of the coffee maker, take the temperature using a, a, a meat thermometer or, or a kitchen thermometer and uh, you know, like take the temperature again, like five minutes later, then 10 minutes later, then 15 minutes later, then 20 minutes later. The assumption I made is that everybody would have a kitchen thermometer, right? They're students, you know, they're living at home. I, I just assume that somebody in the house is needed to get the temperature of something that they cooked at some point so that they would have that sort of thing. And it turned out half the class didn't have it. Right? So uh, they, they all ordered it on Amazon, so now they all have it, but you know, we can't always rely on that, right? So same idea here, you could say one whole cup and they may look at it and be like, all right, let's go in the cabinet. I got a cup there, which one, the big one or the little one, right? Because they don't know necessarily that it's, that it's an actual measurement, right? So we gotta, we gotta make sure we discuss that with them, right? So those three quarters of a cup gives us 100% of calcium, right? So we got everything we needed just based off of those three out of the four cups, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at this and I'm gonna say these, no, I'll just kind of tuck it in here. These four things amount to 100%. I'm sorry, I said four, I meant three. These three things amount to 100%. All right, of calcium. Now what I want to know is, all right, so if they took, if they had one whole cup, what would that equate to? So what we do is we take that 100 and we divide it by three. All right, now we can get that in percent form. We can get that in decimal form. It really doesn't make a difference. Since I already have it in, that 100 is 100%. I'm gonna, I'm gonna expect an answer to be in percent form. But it does give wiggle room for the students to say, all right, well, one whole cup, so one, right? Or 100% of the daily amount, so 100% is one in decimal form, that'd be fine too, right? But this is where my brain took me, and your brain could take you somewhere else, and all I'm saying based off of the problem-solving strategies we were talking about before is, don't think I'm wrong and I won't think you're wrong. So we have a conversation. Hey, why did you, why'd you go with hundred percent? Why didn't you use a one? Okay. And I'd say, well, I, I thought right, all of something, you know, if I'm going to account for every last bit of something that, that means to me 100%. And then you'd say, well, it means to me one. And then you say, okay, agree to disagree or show me how you did it. And I'll show you how I did it. And we'll, we'll see which one's better. And then we can make a decision from there. All right, so if we're dividing 100 by three, three goes into, well, three doesn't go into one at all, 
or it goes in zero times with one left over. Then you have to bring down the zero, but in order to streamline the process, we'd say, okay, well, we're gonna see how many times three goes into 10, three goes into 10 three times, right? Giving us a nine, so it evenly goes in uh, for a total of nine, three times for a total of nine, leaving one left over. And then again, bring down the zero. So it's the same value, so we get a three, which gives a nine, subtract, which brings us a one, and then before too long you realize that it's just gonna be a repeating decimal. So save yourself the time and energy. But I'm not talking to the third graders, fourth graders here, I'm talking to the adults that are, that are taking this class. You save your time and energy, they should actually carry out this process and learn that, oh wait, that, that's just gonna be a repeating decimal. All right, so that's the key there. Oh, that is not my uh, lasso tool, geez. All right, so we got that computation, which is wonderful. So now what I do is I redraw my diagram And I know I'm gonna account for 100 or, well, one whole cup. So we're gonna have more than 100%. Oh, this is killing me. All right, finally. So I got the whole thing shaded in. Each little box amounts to 33 and a third percent. So 33.3 for the love of Christmas. I'm, I'm, I'm getting close. The conniption is going to happen. It's less of it. 33.3. And it's going to be that way for each one. So I'm just going to do it this way. And so then what I'd have to do is multiply this result that 33.3% I'm gonna to have to multiply that value by four because there's four of them, right? So we're looking at 33.3 repeated multiplied by four. And what, the, what the, that ends up equaling would be our result, right? So we can, we can crunch that out in the calculator. We can do it by hand. If we do it by hand, you just gotta be mindful of that repeating decimal. I am gonna show you a slightly different approach in one second that would uh, streamline this a little bit, but it requires you to think it out before you get started. So let's do the 33.3, a whole lot of threes times four. So you can get after it that way, you're looking at uh, 133.3 repeated percent of the daily value. So this is actually a pretty tough question for this, for the, the, the prescribed age group, which is fourth grade, third, fourth grade, depending. So, you know, because it takes a lot of doing. They got to make a plan. They got to think about what approach they're going to take. And this is all after they've gotten some experience with decimals and division and things like that, but not old enough that they would have a whole ton of experience. So they're, they're kind of figuring this out on the fly, all right? But like I said, let me just show you an alternative really quickly. It, it actually starts off with the same framework. I'm just gonna create a little space here. Right. And the key comes down to really not jumping into the math. 
because that that's what happens uh, in a lot of cases what, what students will do uh, and teachers do this too like everybody does it where it's like it's a math problem so I got to start doing math at some point all right so let's just start doing it. let's just start multiplying stuff dividing stuff it'll all kind of work out let's just jump right in instead of doing that start thinking about what you should be doing in terms of the multiplication right so what I'm going to do, so we took the 100, and I'm just going to detail all the steps that we followed. We took the 100, took 100%, and divided by 3. Then took that result and multiplied By four. All right. So we took the 100, divided it by three, and then got that result multiplied by four. Symbolically, what that would be is 100 divided by three. So as a fraction, result multiplied by four. All right. So then the natural question would be did I have to do it in that order? So what I would say is, why not multiply by four uh, then divide by three? You got to be careful about order of operations, but in this case, it'll actually play out. Because when you're multiplying fractions, you multiply top by top and bottom by bottom. So I could take the 100, multiply it by 4, and get 400. The 3, multiply it by 1, and get 3. And now instead of having a multi-step problem that involves a lot of you know, rigor, for that age group, it's definitely rigorous, I made it so that I only have to do the long division once, and the multiplication is already taken care of. All right, so in that regard, it's a matter of saying, okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna take the 400 and divide it by three. Three goes into four once with one left over, bring down the zero. Three goes into 10 three times. Nine, subtract, bring down the zero. Three goes into 10 three times, which gives you a nine. Subtract, bring down the one. Then you get into your decimals and you realize the whole process is going to repeat on and on and on and on and on, at which point you realize that it's got to be 0.3 repeated, giving you the 9 and the 1 and so on. So in terms of difficulty, it's no more challenging than taking the 100 and dividing it by 3 but we have the added bonus of not having to deal with the take, you know, taking that ugly decimal that 33.3 repeated and multiplying that by four. Right. So that that's the, uh, the nice little byproduct that comes out of all of this. Right. So definitely a, a benefit to taking your time and thinking it through, but obviously, you know, there's a level of patience that has to come into play and some people have more of that than others. Right. <clears throat> Uh, the last example on this page, make up a word problem or situation where one object is both, both three quarters of something and one half of something else. Well, I mean, it, it's kind of along the same lines of, uh, of the last example. It's pretty straightforward where you would say, right, my age is three quarters of Tommy's age, but half of, uh, half of grandpa's age, you know, so like that, that's a possibility. You know, so I can, I can say, hey, actually, I'm going to do that. I'm going to say my age is three quarters of, I'll say my cousin Bob's age. but one half of my Uncle Joe's age.
which actually isn't too far off from being the truth. All right. So that, that's an example. You know, you just think of it as in both cases, my, my age is going to be smaller. You know, my, my cousin's older than me and so is my, my uncle, but, and that's not always the case. Sometimes the person, depending on, you know, age relationship between siblings, sometimes the uncle is younger than, than uh, niece or nephew, which is kind of interesting, but, um, but yeah, that, that's a possibility. So I'm, uh, I lost it there for a second, 42 this year. So I could do uh, three quarters that, you know, 42 is three quarters of something else. So that would be the same as saying multiply it by four thirds. So 56 is what Bobby would be. I, I don't, I don't know me, but he's somewhere around there, but I know my uncle Joe is in his mid eighties. So yeah, actually, this, uh, this example might have been inspired by my own personal family situation. So kind of interesting, right? But you could also get into, you know, like uh, consumed uh, items like uh, M&Ms or pizza or something like that. You know, I ate three quarters of a regular pie, you know, a regular pizza pie, so that's six slices, but in terms of a Sicilian, which is, you know, more filling slices, I might have only been able to get through half of that, you know, so I can eat six slices of a regular pie, but I can only eat four slices of a Sicilian pie, so it amounts to three quarters of one and half of the other, right? And so you can get pretty creative with this kind of thing. And the, the whole idea is for, you know, the, the, the making up the word problem with something simple like this, you can assess the math behind it, but really the idea is for the students to try to personalize it so that they understand it in a more intuitive way, right? So if they can kind of relate this to something that they're familiar with on a daily basis, then odds are that the, this content is gonna stick with them. And that's what we're looking for. Looking for long-term retention, not just the short-term. Um, when it comes to equivalent fractions, <clears throat> the <clears throat> there's a, a rationale that comes into it but the idea is that the fractions have infinitely many uh, equivalent values. So one third, for example, could be thought of as the same as two six or three ninths or four twelfths. Okay, so all I'm doing is I'm working with the multiples of one and three, right? And so on. Right, so we're looking at multiples of one, over multiples of three. All right, in order to fully understand this concept, students would need to know what multiples are. All right, you can't even get into this without talking about what a multiple is. All right, so that's pretty important. So, you know, like I, my son's uh, math teacher said, I, I, and I'm pretty sure I'm getting this right, in the beginning of third grade, she said, it, your life is gonna be so much easier if you know your multiplication tables. And then at the end of the year, she followed that up with, was I right? Was your life easier? And, and the students all agreed. They said, yeah, I, I knew my multiplication tables and so math was easy this year. I did not know my multiplication tables and it was a grind, you know? So that, that's part of it, you know? So going third grade to fourth grade, having a good idea, oh, actually, sorry, that was fourth grade going into fifth grade, but still it's the same, same idea. If you know your multiplication tables, you know your multiplication rules, multiples, that's gonna help you with everything else, simplifying fractions, dividing, everything, right? It's like, how do you know how to subtract? Well, you probably learned how to add first. So how do I know that nine minus six is equal to seven? You know, so, oh, nine minus six is equal to seven, Christ. Nine minus six is equal to three, geez. It's, it's almost time for me to like retire or something. So nine minus six is equal to three. I probably know that because I know that three plus six is equal to nine, right? So that, that's part of it. Same thing with multiplication and division. How do I know that 20 divided by two is equal to 10? Probably because I know that two times 10 is 20, right? So in terms of finding equivalent values, 
it goes back to that number line chart that I created before by saying if I want one third, I can break this chart up into three equivalent regions, roughly equivalent, and then just shade in one of them to indicate the region that you want. So if I want this to be equivalent to two over six, and instead of breaking it up into three equivalent regions, I would break it up into six equivalent regions and then shade two of them. And you can see it amounts to the same shading. All right, three ninths, a little bit harder to, to visualize because I can't just cut the intervals that I just created in half again. So I have to get a little bit more creative, but you know, that's part of it. So I know that somewhere around the middle is where four and a half would be. So I want to go just shy of that to create four. So let me call this four. Five. Six, seven, eight, nine. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then I start the journey of kind of like maneuvering things to get the spacing a little bit better. Because it's a little bit more uh, stacked on the low end, but it's more appropriately spaced out on the high end. So, like I said, you know, before you get a ruler involved, it gets a little bit easier, but a carefully constructed uh, rectangle for your students actually goes a long way because if I were to say, I want you to show me what three nines looks like, and then I give them a rectangle that's exactly nine inches long, and I tell them to use a ruler nine centimeters long then it's gonna be much easier because it's gonna line up with the values on the ruler. But if I give them something that's 10 centimeters long or 10 inches long, well, 10 inches would be too big for a sheet of paper, but unless you're going landscape. But if I give them something that's 10 centimeters long or five centimeters long, then they're like, oh crap. You know, they end up doing what I just did and, I, and odds are they're not gonna be as proficient in that as I, as I just ended up being, shockingly, right? So I broke it up into nine roughly equivalent regions and I shade those nine roughly equivalent regions, uh, three of those nine, sorry, and I get the same proportion of the rectangle shaded in, All right? So you know, you're, you know you're doing it right when that happens. And then the last one is 12, so break it up into six and then break it up into uh, halves again. All right, so I want four of these. One, two, three, four. So roughly the same proportion. I mean, mathematically, it's supposed to be the same proportion. It's just the way I drew it. It's roughly the same proportion. But this gets across the idea of equivalent fractions. Like, well, it's the same amount, right? So now let's talk about how you can get it. This is what you'd say to the students. Now let's talk about how you can get from one form to another. And that has to do with factor, uh, factoring your uh, fractions. Right? So I got the whole process written out here. We want to find simplest form, but we also want to be able to find a common denominator. So we'll start with a common denominator. Um, I'll actually take that as a typo too, because it really actually makes more sense to talk about the simplest form before the common denominator. So that's actually what I'm going to do. I'm going to flip to the next page talk about the simplest form and then come back and grab the common denominator. Okay. But like I said, I'll take that as a typo because uh, I want to fix that for future classes, definitely. Okay. The one thing that is not a typo is my little awesome Darth Vader helmets here. I know it's hard to make out, but that's what they are. Okay. And uh, I'm sure you saw a little, uh, earlier my little Yoda, my Yoda uh, bullet points and my baby Yoda bullet points. You know, it's awesome. I don't know what else to tell you. You know, it's just how it is. So what we do in order to write the prime factorization, uh, I'm sorry, geez, words. In order to simplify fractions, we write the prime factorization or just the factorization really. 
So I'm going to take the number 12 and I'm going to list out all possible factors. I'm going to do the same thing for 16. And factors, again, if, uh, if the word factor or factoring sends shivers down your spine and not in a good way, uh, it's probably because you remember like polynomial factoring, you know, difference of perfect squares and stuff like that. This isn't that. This is just starting with the number one, write down every number in increasing order that divides evenly into the number 12 and then do the same thing for 16. So one goes into 12 evenly, two goes into 12 evenly, so does three, so does four, five doesn't. If you divide 12 by five, you're gonna get a decimal or a fraction. Six does, seven doesn't, eight doesn't, nine doesn't, 10 doesn't, 11 doesn't, but 12 does. All right, a little, uh, little tip, and this is something that uh, you could probably hang on to. That halfway point, and, you, and share this with your students when you have them. Maybe some of you have them already. The halfway point, so whatever the, that number is divided by two, that's the last factor prior to the number itself, all right? So once I get up, so for the 16, once I get up to the number eight, I could jump right to the 16, because anything between eight and 16 would necessarily have to be a, a fractional quotient, all right? So I'm gonna take number one, two goes into 16 evenly, three doesn't, four does, five doesn't, six doesn't, seven doesn't, eight does, but I'm at the halfway point to 16, so now I can jump right to 16, All right? Now, again, like I said before, that's, I don't think anyway, that's, I don't think that's something you give to the students without them coming up with, you know, something that's leading them down that road first. I want, when, when, when I give that little nugget away, I want the students to have kind of met me halfway on that idea. I don't want them necessarily to say, hey, I noticed that once I get up to the halfway point, then I can jump right to the final value. You know, like, it's not really like that. It's more like, so I noticed that once I get to a certain value, then there isn't a whole heck of a lot left. So can I just like skip lots of values from like, once I get to eight, do I have to, do I have to look at all the values between eight and 16? It doesn't seem like any of them are gonna work. That's when you reveal to the class, once you get to the halfway point, then you can stop, right? And, and just jump right to the end point, right? So it's, it's like a big reveal, you know, you're kind of saving the good stuff, but also you, you want to see how far along you can get them in terms of getting them to the conclusion themselves without you having to spoon feed it to them, all right? Because, and I think we'll all agree with this, whenever, hopefully, maybe you've never experienced this. If you haven't, then, and I, then, then it, that stinks because it's a great feeling. When you come up with the content yourself, when you come up with a mathematical understanding yourself without having, being told, having to be told a rule, when you have that aha moment, not only do you feel like a million bucks, but also you're never gonna forget because you invented that. You know, so don't rob your students of that experience. It's, it's a really powerful moment for them. And it, it really is that, you know, like the students that grew up hating math versus the ones who grew up loving math. The ones who grew up loving math most likely had more of those aha experiences because they were allowed to. So let your students have those moments, all right? Don't, don't just give it all away, all right? Um, so anyway, what I wanna do is go through the list and identify the largest number that's in common between the two sets. So when I go through the list, I actually work from high to low. So instead of going low to high, we created the list by going low to high. Now let's evaluate the list by going high to low. So I'd look at the 12 and I'd say, is there a 12 in my 16 list? The answer is no. So let's get rid of the 12. Let's not even look at it anymore. Is there a six in my 16 list? No, same deal. But then you can also bounce back and forth. You can look at the 16 and say, is there a 16 in my 12 list? No. So that's not in common. Is there a six in my 16 list? No. Is there an eight in my 12 list? No. So it actually turns out that the largest number that's in common between the two data sets 
would be the number four. So what we then do is we take the 12 and divide it by four. And then we take the 16 and divide it by four. All right, now this is all part of the fraction because you can do whatever you want to a fraction as long as it, through multiplication or division, as long as you do the same operation to the top and the bottom. All right, so if I want to multiply the top and bottom by a number, I can do that same number. Divide the top and bottom by a number, as long as they're the same, you're good. And you, you just can't do it with zero. Multiply top and bottom or divide top and bottom by zero, that's a no-go, right? You get, um, you get an undefined fraction or you get something that's called indeterminate, right? Bottom line is we're gonna get three quarters here. And that's really it, all right? So we have the two methods for coming up with these values. One method was the analytic approach or the numerical approach. The other method is a, a visual approach. So if I have my 12 sixteenths, what I would be looking at is again, slicing it down the middle repeatedly until I have a total of 16 values. So I'm up to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm gonna kind of move some things around to make it look a little bit more uh, evenly distributed. Then I'm gonna split each of these intervals again, and I'll have a total of 16 values. All right, so then I have 12 of them accounted for. Uh, I'll use my shading tool. Oh boy, there's no valid reason for why that happened. All right, so I'm not gonna use my shading tool. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. All right, now the this graphical approach really only works for simple cases, but it's, it's a technique that's gonna play out. It's just a matter of patience. So what I start doing is I slice it down the middle first, all right? So I cut it down the middle and I say to myself, all right, if I shade one half of this, so I have two regions, if I just shade one of them, will I have what I need? Meaning, will it be equivalent amount to the first rectangle that I shaded? No, because I'd only have half of what I need. All right, not a, uh, I'd say two thirds actually. All right, so I split it again. Now I look at this and I say, is there some way that I can shade this so that my second rec rectangle occupies or uh, really uh, amounts to the same shaded region as my first rectangle? And the answer is yes, if I shade three of these rectangles, three of these subintervals, I'll have the same amount accounted for. So in this case, I had 12 out of 16. And in this case, I had three out of four. Like I said, it only really works for nice cases because if I, if I had something like 12 seventeenths, and I was looking for an equivalent fraction, you're gonna be at it for a while, right? Because that 12 17 is already in simplest form, right? So you're not gonna come up with some other fraction that's simpler that's gonna be equivalent, right? So it's kind of tricky in that regard, but you know, that's, that's part of the fun, I guess, right? The six over 24 is gonna to amount to pretty much the same idea, except you have a lot more partitions that you have to create. So you sl uh, slice it down the middle, Slice it again, so now I have four intervals. Slice it again, so now I have eight intervals. Then I have 16 intervals. But then I gotta start moving stuff around, all right? Because I got 16, if I slice it again, I'm gonna get to 32, and that's gonna be too much. So what I need are eight more intervals 
So I'm going to have to move some things around. My intervals are going to be narrower, but I have to account or amount to just eight more intervals. So I'll slide them in here. So I'll move these over. And again, this is all this technique I'm only doing because I'm not using a ruler. If I was using a ruler, then I would just take the total distance and divide it by 24. And that's how much I would mark off each interval. All right. So All right, so one, two, three, four. So I got to make it even narrower. So I got four out of the eight extra intervals that I needed to have in there. So now I just need to get four more. One, two, three. And then you could, like I said, you could just work on the spacing. It looks like on the low end, it's fine. I just kind of need to even it out on the high end and that's okay. Right, and so six of these are what's going to be shaded in. So one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so then in terms of the equivalent fraction, so what do I do? I split it down the middle. I split it again down the middle, and I see if there's some way that I can shade this so that I have equivalent fractions or equivalent uh, shaded regions. And it looks like I do. If I just shade this first interval, I have what I'm looking for. So this first interval here seems to be the uh, equivalent in length to the six over 24. So six over 24 appears to be equivalent to one fourth. All right, so that's great news. You know, the hard work happened in creating the partitions, but after that, it, it worked out nicely. But in terms of the, uh, the computations, I would still need factors of six, one, two, three, and then six. I knew I could jump from three to six because three is half of six. And then 24, one, two, three, four, not five, but six, not seven, but eight, not nine, not 10, not 11, but 12. And then we can hop on up to 24. Okay. Now, if you do a compare and contrast between the two lists, you can see that six is the largest number that divides evenly into both, into both the six and the 24. So then once I have that, just a matter of taking each of the values, six and 24, and dividing them by six, and I get one over four. All right. So that's pretty much taking something that people know and are comfortable with and making it a way more complicated than it needs to be. But the idea, and, and it always comes down to this, uh, common core, next gen, uh, everyday math, they're all, you know, like uh, the old expression, I, I forget, was it in Dante's Inferno? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's a, a famous line. I just can't remember what it's from. Uh, but, but that's really what, what we're dealing with here. So the intentions are for students to really grasp the underlying concepts, to really have a firm understanding of why things work the way they do. An old movie, um, Crimson Tide, uh, one of my favorite movies of all time. It's on my Mount Rushmore. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's such a wonderful movie, but there, there was a, there was a key exchange in there between Gene Hackman and Denzel Washington, where there are two, two Navy, uh, Navy guys, one's a captain and one's a first officer. 
and they're they're around the dinner table and they're talking uh you know talking theory you know like naval uh, procedures and politics and stuff like that and <clears throat> the older guy the captain said you know like when i was coming up they just told me uh you know push a button and i was happy to be here and everything's fine i'm, I'm definitely uh, paraphrasing uh they they told me how to do stuff they seem to be more concerned with you learning why you know and so the older generations it was all about how do you do this how do you do that how do you how do you do that now we we care about whether or not they know why things work the way they do right so it's not just a matter of crunching numbers because we have things that crunch numbers you have a, an example of it right on your screen here we don't need people who can come out and be human calculators we need people who can problem solve right so that that's what this is coming down to so yeah is this the best strategy i don't know the rotel is paid with good intentions so it's like the idea behind it is sound making individuals come away with the idea that no matter what problem is presented to me i can tackle it with the skills i already have carrying that out making that really happen in reality is, is a different conversation right but it's it's an ongoing battle and that's what we're working towards and that's what we should always be working towards right so why do we do things the way we do we do that in, with the ultimate end game of fostering the independent thought that only comes when people struggle through understanding concepts on their own in small groups things like that but they flesh it out on their own not where you're up at the board saying, now let's try this problem. Now let's try that problem. Now let's try that problem, right? It's not about getting stuff right on a test. It's about understanding, all right? So that's the simplest form. Oh, I gotta go back. Um, for a common denominator, it's most commonly, and no pun intended, confused with the concepts associated with uh, simplest form. Right, because you say write a list of several multiples of each denominator. Right, so now I'm not looking for the factors of the denominators, I'm looking for the multiples of each denominator. So I have a denominator of three and a denominator of seven. All right, now I've seen cases where teachers would say, well, they don't know what denominator, they don't know that word. So I'm just going to say bottom number. That's great. That's a great strategy. As long as you translate that into the proper use of the term denominator at some point, right? The students need to know what the proper terminology is. They don't have to start there, but they need to end up there, right? So at first, in the beginning, you don't have to use the term numerator and the term denominator. You can use top number, bottom number, but eventually we got to get to a point where they know numerator, denominator. Right, so we're gonna write multiples. So three, oh, wrong color. Three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, and so on. All right, I said several multiples. I did six multiples. How do I know enough's enough? I don't, I don't know until I start diving into it. All right, so, for seven, seven, 14, 21, 28, 35, and so on. So I look at what I have here and I see, well, there's nothing in common. Yet, I cut off my multiples of three too quickly, right? I thought I would have enough, but I didn't, I didn't quite have enough because the next one would be 21, and then 24 four and then so on after that it turns out i needed to go a couple extra steps but i didn't know that going in i only knew that after i started listing the multiples of, of seven right so sometimes that's the case where you cut it short you move on to the next number and then you come back and you say okay now i see it the 21 is the smallest number that's in common between the two sets right so if I wanna have equivalent fractions with those common denominators, so my target number is 21, I have a two thirds. I wanna make that into a denominator of 21. Can't just turn it into a 21. 
I have to use proper mathematical technique. So in order to make a three into a 21, I need to multiply by seven, right? So then the question would be, well, how do I know it's multiplying by seven? Well, it's the seventh number that I wrote out when I listed my multiples. This is three times one, three times two, times three, times four, times five, six, and seven. That's a way to kind of get around students who don't know their math facts, you know, in terms of the multiplication tables, because what do they do? In order to list the multiples, they say three, all right? Then I need to get to six, so three more. Okay, six, three more, nine, three more, 12, three more, 15, then 18 and so on. But then if you label them and say, this is my first value, second value, third value, we know that we're dealing with seven. Right, so seven is my multiplier. I'm gonna to multiply top and bottom by seven and I'm gonna get 14 over 21. Right, if I'm taking six sevenths and I wanna have a common denominator, and you know, I, I tried to keep it consistent in terms of the spacing. It got a little wonky at the end, but the one, two, three also corresponds with the seven. The first, second, third value. Third value is 21. Seven times three is 21. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom here by three if my pen wants to work. So three over three. When you're multiplying fractions again, it's top times top, bottom times bottom. So 18 out of 21. All right. So now that I have a common denominator, it's kind of like I standardized it. I now have a level playing field. I can combine them if I want. If I needed to add these two numbers, I can just add across the numerators and keep the denominators the way they are. All right. That's not what it's asking us to do here, but that, that's an application of it. Addition and subtraction, that's really why we find common denominators. Because I just demonstrated that in order to multiply fractions, you definitely do not need a common denominator. If you've got a common denominator, that's fine when you're multiplying. The problem is you then have to simplify. So it's kind of a, a you're creating more work for yourself. It's a waste of time. Right? But sometimes you gotta waste that time in order to know that it's a waste of time. Right? So we're hopping along to page six. So we're kind of coming down the, the home stretch here. The rationale for converting or comparing fractions or the idea behind it, if we want to compare fractions, we can, we can convert to decimal form. We can use common denominators. We can cross multiply or we can use common numerators. All right. So any one of these three approaches are all, all, are all reasonable. If we convert to decimal form, it's very straightforward in terms of what you need to do. Actually carrying it out is a different story. All right. So it depends on what you need them to do. If I'm going to do it by converting to decimal form, I'm going to take the 12 and divide it by the 60. So for now, just to keep things moving, as they say, I'm going to use a calculator. That's going to give me a point two. Now, if you know two tenths, point, uh, uh, two over 10 is the same as saying two tenths, All right, and two tenths in decimal form is 0.2. Right, so we can then say, or you can actually carry out the division if you want and say two divided by 10 is equal to two tenths. But if you could recognize it just based off of its name, you would know that they are equivalent without having to do the work. Poor quality use, so let me fix that. All right, so we know that they're equivalent just based off of the name. Two tenths, 0 0.2, well, 12 over 60 is the same as 0 0.2, so we're good. All right, so that's all there is to that. 
if you got to do the division, do the division. That's not a big deal either. Two divided by 10, but I kind of, I always have it in my mind that if the students start saying it correctly, like two over 10 is two tenths, and they'll start thinking it correctly and then they'll end up writing it correctly, right? So that, that's part of the fun. We could also do the common denominator approach, right? So I would look at my two denominators just like we did on the, the last exercise. I have the 16 and the eight. I would look at a few different, you know, the first couple of multiples of 16 and the first couple of multiples of eight. So 16, 32, 48, we could also do 8, 16, 24, and so on in each case. It goes on forever. But it doesn't take too long before you realize that the 16 is the smallest number that's in common between the two sets. Right? So I don't have to change the 7 16 at all. Right? So I'm going to leave that alone. The 4 over 8, I want to make that into a denominator of 16. Right? This is my first value. This is my second value. So I'm going to multiply by two. And that's going to give me eight over 16. All right. Seven over 16 is not equal to eight over 16. So these are not equivalent. Right, so we're looking at only the numerators because those are the only things that would differ from one fraction to another. The, 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 the denominators are the same. So if the denominators are the same and the numerators are different, then the fractions are not equal to one. Right, it's kind of like if I had, you know, two fractions with the denominator of two. You know, one of them has a numerator of one and the other has a numerator of two. So one over two and two over two couldn't possibly be equal. All right, one of them is a half and the other is equivalent to one. All right, so that's another strategy. Cross multiplication is pretty popular, it's quick and easy. What we do is we make the assumption that the two fractions are equal to one another, really for the older students, but it's still an appropriate technique. It's just, I wouldn't really rely on the younger ones totally understanding why this works the way it does. But it gives them a technique that they can use and it's pretty quick and easy. So uh, cross multiply. So diagonal down should be equal to diagonal up or vice versa. One times 64, we want to know is that equal to eight times eight? Well, 64 is equal to 64. So these are equivalent. All right. And then last but not least is the idea of a common numerator, which is weird because we always talk about common denominators in terms of adding and subtracting fractions, but common numerators are pretty important too because of what I was saying before. And that is if you have two parts of a fraction that are equivalent, like the two bottoms, the two denominators, if those are equivalent to one another, then if the numerators are different, then the two fractions are different. But if the two numerators are the same, then the fractions are the same. So we can do the same thing where we hold the numerator constant and go from there. So we just do the same thing that we did for a common denominator, except we just apply it to the numerator, right? So I have a two. I'm going to list out some multiples of so two, four, six, doesn't take too long before you find it. And then three, three, six, nine, 12, and so on. We want the smallest value that's common between the two sets, which would be six. All right, so that's telling me for my two over 12, I want to multiply by some number in order to make that two into a six. It's the third entry in my list. So I'm going to multiply by three and I get six over 36. And then I do the same for the three over 18. 
except I'm going to multiply by 2 over 2 because it's the second entry in the list. So 6 over 36. All right, these are the same. So that means that they're equivalent. Now, you wouldn't be able to necessarily add the two fractions if you get a common numerator. It just so happens in this case that we, our common numerator also led to a common denominator, but that doesn't always play out, all right? So you just gotta be careful about that. It's only used, this technique so far anyway, it's only really used for determining fractional equivalents. So something to be mindful of, all right? So last but not least is the concept of fractional value, uh, sorry, uh, percents. We already talked about fractions and we already kind of alluded to percents, but this is where we're gonna pretty much end the unit. Well, that's exactly what's gonna happen. We're gonna end the unit here, right? So last little bit of content. And we've already kind of addressed pretty much all of these concepts. So this should be pretty quick. All right, so when we talk about 2%, and I threw in the definition of percent because like I was saying before, given a little history, and again, a simple history is, uh, is always a good thing. So percent per dash cent, cent as in hundred or centum. Uh, so per as in by, you know, if I say, I'm gonna take uh, two and divide it by three, I, it's also saying two per every three units. And so it, it implies a division. But when I say two per cent, it's two per 100 or two out of 100, all right? We can also apply it to a somewhat reasonable real world problem, nothing too crazy. In the past 100 days it rained 12 times. What percent of days did it rain? Well. If it rained 12 times, it's 12 out of 100. So that corresponds to 12%. So 12% of those days. The, uh, the word problem. Pan family bought three pizza pies to share with friends while attending a drive-in movie at White Plains High School. That really happened. Uh, each pie consisted of eight slices. All right, the group ate all but 10 slices of, uh, of pizza. What percent of the available pizza was eaten? All right, so we had eight slices per pie. We're gonna multiply that by three pies. That's 24 slices, all right? We ate all but 10 slices, all but. So that means that there were 10 slices left over, right? So, so there were 10 left. That means that there were 14 slices eaten. So we want to know what percent of the available pizza was eaten. So that would amount to 14 out of the 24, 14 slices eaten, 24 available. Then it's a matter of, okay, pick your favorite method. I'm just, again, in the interest of time, I'm just going to do a quick division on the calculator. We're looking at 58.3%. So in, in decimal form, it's 0.583 repeated. But we know if we're going to go to percent form, we have to multiply by 100. Can't take that step for granted. The, uh, the students wouldn't necessarily know to do that unless they're told to. And so we have 58.3%. All right, which, which brings up the conversation of like approximation an estimation where I'd say, all right, about what percentage was eaten. If you were to say a little over 50% or around 60%, you would be right. If I called for an approximation, right? Not always the case though, right? Sometimes we need the exactitude, right? 
So in short, a fraction from Latin fractus, which means broken, fun fact of the day, represents a part of a whole or more generally any number of equal parts. But it means so much more. Rarely do values in the real world amount to whole number values, right? So you can see here, like we had 14 slices eaten out of 24 available, but that amounted to 58.3% of the pizza, right? So not a clean number by any estimation, right? Um, so you have this example here. What does the following table tell us? We have latest job approval rating. So the approval rating is 42% term average to date 40 percent highest job approval rating to date 49 percent lowest job approval rating to date 35 percent so these are all percentages and my answer to this would be and this isn't really a question for your students just to get you thinking a little bit doesn't really tell us much of anything doesn't tell us much without knowing, well, really without knowing more information, but without knowing how many people were polled. Right, because forty-two percent is a reasonable value, I think. But I is that forty-two percent out of a hundred people, or is it forty-two percent out of a thousand people, or is it forty-two percent out of a hundred thousand people? You know, what are we looking at? You know, if I tell you that I ate fifty-eight point three percent of the available pizza, but I don't tell you how many slices were available to begin with, you could correctly assume that there was only one slice available and I ate a little bit more than half of that one slice. All right, so a completely different conclusion. You know, I mean, this is, this is pizza that was shared with a bunch of people, but let's say I'm an animal and I'm just going after it. You gave me three pies of pizza, honestly, I could do 14 slices. Like that, that I mean, that, that's totally within my wheelhouse. But like you look at that and you say, well, 58.3% of the pizza, it, you tell me it's one pie. All right, a little bit more than four slices. Three pies, all right, around 14 slices, all right? One slice, that's about half, a little bit more than half of a slice. It all depends on how many, how many slices were available. So that approval rating, you know, and you know, fun fact, I mean, it's, I, I got this off a website, it's uh, presidential stuff. Uh, related to uh, uh, recent polls. But the one thing that it was missing was uh, who, who was polled? I, I don't know. So it doesn't tell us much without knowing how many, how many people were involved. So I could look at this and say 35% was the lowest approval rating. If that's only 100 people, I don't know if that's meaningful outcome. But if it's 1 million people, then that's disturbing. You know, so it's, it's all relative to how many individuals are in the original data set right so that's kind of like that's the conversations that you want to engage in with your students because you don't want to just leave it up to all right take this divide it by that multiply it by 100 and you have it right? you're not teaching them anything if you do that all right so that's the unit uh, that was a uh, a lot of talking but it, it had to be done 